President Obama's impact on Ohio. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Laura Bischoff, State House reporter for the Dayton Daily News. Julie Carr Smythe, State House correspondent for the Associated Press. Herb Asher, OSU political scientist. And Mike Gonadakis, Republican strategist. Next week, President elect Donald Trump takes the oath of office. This week, President Obama took his final bows. In a farewell address in Chicago, the president touted what he considers the high points of his administration. Seven years of job growth, the auto bailout, 20 million more Americans with health insurance, legal gay marriage, the Iran nuclear deal, and the killing of bin Laden. That's what we did. That's what you did. You were the change. You answered people's hopes. And because of you, by almost every measure, America is a better, stronger place than it was when we started. Here in Ohio, things seem better. The unemployment rate has gone from 8 percent when Obama took office down to 5 percent. But the number of people working remains about the same. The difference is the size of Ohio's labor force. It has shrunk by a quarter of a million people, and wages for most Ohioans have remained fairly stagnant. Julie Carr Smythe, looking at the objective measures, is Ohio better than when the president started? I think that Ohio has certainly benefited from the auto uh, industry um, bailout because of the fact that they had so many jobs. And we have a lot of industry that is tied to that as well in terms of just suppliers and that kind of thing. So I think for sure that saved a lot of jobs in Ohio. I think that overall the state is in better shape. It, there's always the question of, you know, was that the federal uh, government policies? Was that John Kasich's policies? It was the Obama Kasich recovery. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and of course, not everybody has felt it. Um, we did uh, some polling at AP after the election and found that uh, there's a real disconnect between the, these objective factors that we're talking about and what how people feel. People did not feel when they voted for Donald Trump that things were necessarily better for them. Was it her because the expectations were so high that that no matter what happened, it wasn't going to in, meet in the part, expectations. But I think the president also acknowledged this past week that he was not a very effective communicator about the things that actually happened during his administration, particularly as it dealt with the economic recovery. And of course, Ohio is better off. Back when he became president, the choice was, were we going from a great recession to a depression or from a great recession to a recovery? And we've clearly gone to a recovery. And certainly, I think the point that Julie made about the auto industry that's absolutely critical. And then I think the question about how many Ohioans today have health care who did not have health care before. And this is a very relevant issue in Ohio, given yeah. a number of our communities where people have been terribly underserved in terms of health care delivery. Mike, you have a different perspective, I'm sure. But John Kasich touted the economic gains during his six years, and they pretty much overlap President Obama's. Eight years. Sure. Uh, you know, President Obama uh, deserves credit for some good things he's done and, and helped the Ohio economy. But John Kasich brought Amazon to Ohio, not Barack Obama. John Kasich expanded Amazon Medicaid. jobs aren't even really here yet. Yeah. Well, we just had how many? We had a billion dollar investment in Hilliard and New yeah. Albany and other cities with, with mm -hmm. Amazon. And then the promise this week from their CEO that they're going to have 100,000 jobs, not all in Ohio, but, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, some in Ohio. But, you know, at the end of the day, from a political perspective, uh, Barack Obama's done wonders for the Republican Party in the state of Ohio. When he took office, every statewide office except for Mary Taylor was run by a Democrat. The Speaker of the House was a Democrat, Armand Budish. Now fast forward at the end of his term, Republicans control the entire state government with historic numbers and every statewide office. So I think it's a rejection from the voters of the policies from the Obama administration. Laura, what do you make? Is it can Republicans say that they ran successfully against Obama and it helped them in this state? Uh, I think to some degree they did, but you know, also I think that the Democratic Party in Ohio is pretty weak, the state the statewide Democratic Party. Um, the fact that they won in 2006, I think, was a, was a direct result of the uh, scandal uh, that developed out of the Bureau of Workers' Compensation and the uh, investments in gold, gold coins and the ethics scandals that kind of stemmed out from that. Um, I think that uh, Obama's legacy 
in Ohio, um, you know, when I think back eight years ago, uh, we were in a financial meltdown. I remember being very concerned about my, my 401k, my kids' college savings accounts. And I think that, um, you know, we kind of pulled it out of, out of a tailspin there. It's hard to say what didn't happen, like hard, hard to prove yeah. what didn't right. happen. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, I think that uh, when the final budget of Ted Strickland's administration came in, he used that one-time money, which we talk about a lot, and came up in his Senate race. But uh, his argument this last year was, well, you know, by being able to use that one-time money, we saved, you know, police jobs, fire jobs, teachers, and other things that may have had to go away because of that. Why haven't wages increased? Because the the jobs that are coming in to substitute for the manufacturing jobs don't pay as well, the benefits aren't as good. Mm -hmm. and, they and we finally now see, it's only two months worth of data, but we now finally see that wages seem to be increasing at a rate greater than the inflation rate. But that's only really in the last two or three months that we've seen that. If that continues for another year, then in fact that we begin to get the last part of the recovery, not just simply recovering jobs, but recovering wages, if you will. And as you said, Herb said that wages are, are ticking up, but um, when health care continues to skyrocket, when local taxes continue to go up, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, it doesn't matter how much your wages are going up when you're paying more just to live in Ohio, which causes the brain drain. Coal uh, is not a, it's not a huge issue here in central Ohio, but it is in the eastern part of the state. The coal industry has really declined. The industry and supporters of coal blame President Obama, Laura, but also natural gas plays as big, if not a larger role in the in the decline of the coal industry. Oh, in I would argue it, it plays a much bigger, yeah. like the biggest portion of the role. I mean, the natural gas um, fired plants for electricity are kind of the way the industry standard now. It's um, more affordable than digging out the coal. Um, certainly, we still need coal for baseline electric generation, but it's um, it's just a, a matter of economics. Would gay marriage have happened if it was a Republican um, in, the, in the White House? Would that have been made legal? Because it was an Ohio case, mm -hmm. along with other, ca other yeah, cases Yeah, but that, as went, well. that went through the Supreme Court. I, yeah. I think yeah. that was, um, m maybe if, if, uh, if we had had a, Repu if, if it was uh, Mitt Romney in there, there would have been different appointees to the Supreme Court <laughs> under McCain and Romney. I agree with Laura. Just to take it one step further, though, uh, no, gay marriage would not be legal in the United States if Mitt Romney was president or John McCain because they would not have appointed Sotomayor and Kagan. They would have appointed two justices like Scalia, which would have said it's a state's issue. He wouldn't have said gay, he wouldn't have opined on this. They, they would have just said it's a state's rights issue, just like we believe abortion should be a state's rights issue. So if Ohio wanted to have it, that's great. If not, that's great, too, according to the court, if Romney or McCain would have been elected. Okay, let's get to our next topic. Despite some cooling feats among Republicans in Congress, Donald Trump seems set on getting rid of the Affordable Care Act. It'll be repeal and replace. It will be essentially simultaneously. It will be various segments, you understand, but will most likely be on the same day or the same week, but probably the same day. On Capitol Hill, some Republican lawmakers seem not to want to rush. In Ohio, two studies came out this week, one by Harvard Medical School and New York University. That one predicts a million Ohioans would lose health coverage. The liberal think tank t uh, Policy Matters Ohio adds that Ohio hospitals would lose $15 billion over eight years if it's repealed. Laura Bischoff, this law, which has been in place now for six years, has already deeply ingrained itself in the Ohio economy. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's, um, you know, there's 20 million people nationwide that are on Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act. And in Ohio, there's 700,000 people who are on it through expanded Medicaid and another 230,000 who are buying it through the, uh, the marketplace. It's helped reduce um, Ohio's un uninsured rate from 11 percent back in 2013 to 6.5 percent in 2015. So, um, you know, it's definitely ingrained. There are, you know, there are people that don't like it because it's still very costly on the premiums and out-of-pocket out of costs for people who don't have substantial subsidies. Um, and then also there's just a matter of principle of whether or not the federal government should be spending all this money. What happens, Herb, if it goes away? Uh, well, if it goes away without any replacement, mm -hmm. uh, actually a lot of people in Ohio and the country will be hurting and the healthcare industry will be hurting. So I, th I don't think that's really an option. I think as you talk to more and more Republicans, including local Republicans, uh, they're very sensitive to the fact that you can't simply repeal it without having a replacement already in, ready to be put into place. And the, the political charge here would be, 
the Republicans have been talking for six years about repealing it. Okay, let's, where, where's the replacement? And I think more and more Republicans are, especially in states like Ohio, are recognizing here that uh, you can't just flippantly say, well, we'll repeal it and we'll replace it in the same day or the same week or whatever, that there probably needs to be some real discussion. Now, the real question becomes, can they actually change the Affordable Care Act in any sort of bipartisan way? The answer may be no, but in fact, the best thing that could happen for both the country and for the GOP is if somehow they could get Democrats recognizing that in fact there are some changes that need to be made and then try to do things in a, you know, simultaneously, if you will, and if you want to call it Trump care, fine. And the thing is that uh, if they're going to do it on the same day, it's not going to be a day anytime soon because there's a lot of work that has to go into this replacement. Uh, I know that John Kasich is heading out there this coming week to be part of a round table. He's been a huge uh, supporter of the Medicaid expansion element of this, whether or not they can spin that out. I mean, uh, Republicans like him who have supported that are are looking at budgets right now across the country. We've got state budgets that are looking at shortfalls that are going to have real hard times if, if they get hit with that by a Republican Congress, and that is not going to look good for them. Why can you replace, can Republicans replace Obamacare and keep all of those 900,000 people insured here in Ohio? Well, I would just like to point out that Obamacare and Medicaid expansion are separate. There's similarities, but they're separate. You can repeal Obamacare and still have Medicaid expansion. I know the Republicans have talked about doing more block grants. So when we talk about the 700,000 on Medicaid expansion, new people, those with mental illness or the poorest of the poor, they're not going to lose their health care because they're on Medicaid. Now, we know Obamacare, the skyrocketing premiums, the fact that the IRS will tax you and fine you if you don't, if you're, if you don't have the health insurance, that's not what people want. That's not what America wants. So we can do better. Let's do better. So at the end of the day, the Republicans will put a, a plan. It might not be 100%. It might not be perfect, but we will repeal Obamacare. But the skyrocketing premiums are affecting a relative few because if there are 200,000 people in Ohio using the exchange, that's only 2% of the state's population. Now, those are the folks who do face, if you're not in the subsidy, face high deductibles and high premiums. But most folks get their insurance through their employer. And they haven't, they've seen increases, but not skyrocketing costs. Well, I would submit that, you know, just look at the younger people, the 20-year-olds that are in retail or, or working at restaurants all throughout Easton and Polaris. They don't have insurance through their employer, so they have to, are forced to go to the exchanges. But at the end of the day, when Blue Cross Blue Shield pulls out, and, you know, that famous line, if you like your doctor, you can keep it, which political facts said it was the lie of the year two years ago, it, it, it's just broken. We need. It's okay to say it's, it, we, we can fix this. And Democrats should come to the ta table. Instead of saying, well, what's your plan? Why don't they offer something? Because they have to admit that it's broken, but too. But they have it. They have it. They have they the plan. It's called Obamacare. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that, well, that's why they lost this election. I know. That's why they lost this election. And it's not unreasonable to expect that the GOP would put on the table the GOP plan because they've been talking for years about this. So, it, so it's, but it really would be better for the country if actually the two parties would actually start to decide. Because certainly Democrats, including Clinton, including former President Clinton, have all acknowledged that there are problems. There's no price controls on, yeah. on a hospital or a prescription drug, which is a huge problem. Would Republicans support price controls on prescription drugs? Well, you heard the president-elect at his first press conference, which was unique, but uh, he said the drug companies are getting away with robbery and we're going to rein them in. So Trump is a unique Republican. He's different. So, And I think most of Americans stood up and applauded when he said, when we all agree our prescription drugs are too expensive. Thank you, Donald Trump. But Mike's question is, would the GOP agree with their president. Well, they better get on the Trump train. <laughs> <laughs> they better get on the Trump train. Right, because uh, I think that the, you know, the, the issue here is that both the parties need to come together in order for Republicans to make good on, on their other uh, criticism that the Democrats did, did this without bipartisan support. And mm -hmm. so do we want another, do we want another plan that only has one party's support? We shall see. It's a big issue, huge issue. With about six months to, uh, or a year before the start of the 2018 statewide campaign, both major political parties in Ohio are in states of flux. Democrats have steady leadership at the state party level, but a lack of big-name candidates to compete statewide. Republicans have a glut of candidates for the statewide offices, but discord in its party leadership with the recent takeover of the GOP chair by Trump supporters. Herb Asher, which party's in better shape in Ohio right now? <laughs> uh, the Republican Party by far, in, in part because assembling a statewide ticket 
it, re Republicans have a deep bench. Uh, perhaps one of the consequences of the recent battle for control of the state party will be that maybe the new state chair might not be as effective in trying to build a ticket or convincing people what office to run for. Remember, the late Bob Bennett just did a spectacular job in terms of placing candidates in the right position, looking to the future and all of that. So uh, that would be a challenge. But, but again, I'd much rather be the Republican Party right now in terms of saying, look at all these incumbent statewide office holders I have. They'll have to sort it out. Some of them will sort it out on their own. They may need to be pushed by some financial people and by, in fact, uh, the state party itself. Democrats really do not have a deep uh, farm team. But, Laura, there, there's a revolt right now in the Republican Party. And it's, it's, it was settled last week when Jane Timken, Jane Timken won the chair's spot. But there's still some, there's right, some I mean, wounds I, that have I, to be healed there. I talked to um, Jane Timken immediately afterwards, and she said that um, it wasn't so much of a proxy war between Trump and Kasich, how the press had been painting it, but that a lot of local chair, county chairs felt like they had been neglected under the Borges uh, administration, that they weren't getting what they needed, and that they were, that's why they were backing her. Now, that said, it was obvious that there was a big proxy war between Kasich and, and Trump. Trump made personal phone calls to members of the 66-member of the, uh, State Central Committee to try to flip some votes, and, and he managed to get it very close. They took two rounds of votes, and Timken got 34. Four, and 33, 33 and, and Matt got 32 and so it was um, and and on Matt's side of things you know he had uh, a lot of case team Kasich was really behind him and uh, it's interesting that you know back in 2012 almost there was a big ouster of um, Kevin DeWine Kevin DeWine had been the chair of the party had been kind of groomed by by Bob Bennett and just came off winning pretty much everything and Governor Kasich said I'd like to put my own person in and he said no I'm not backing down and so then Kasich went about um, stocking the Central Committee with his loyalists. Right. But the point on the statewides is that all of this stuff is quite interesting to us as political reporters, but from a standpoint of a voter, um, the Republicans have so many more at least um, relatively well-known names you know, out there. We have John Houston, we have Lieutenant Governor Mary Taylor, and we have Mike DeWine. Um, on the Democratic side, some of the big names, uh, of course, have been working with the Democratic president, which makes sense, Richard Cordray, some of the former Congress people and that kind of thing. And so we'll see who emerges and they keep on ar arising, but most of them are people, some of us don't even don't know their names yet very think well. About the now, Mike, if, 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 if this was a change election and we're not through with the change yet, is it going to be an advantage to have a familiar name in 2018? Or might the Democrats be able to say, you know what, we're the change candidates for the state of Ohio? Well, Ohio doesn't move as, as fast as the nation does on elections. And I would argue that as, as, it really doesn't come down to if the nominees Houston, DeWine, Taylor, Renacci. It's going to be how does Donald Trump do in his first two years. It's a midterm election. The party out of power historically does better. But with that said, because as we said here uh, just a moment ago, the Democrat Party in Ohio is so decimated and it's so down with lack of a farm team, your words, Mike, that I think even we could survive if Trump, did, and I don't think he will, but if he did go south early on, that we could survive that wave of, of Democrat enthusiasm because they lack leadership. At the end of the day, um, I, think, I think I heard someone say it's inside baseball, and it is, but um, Husted, DeWine, Renacci, Taylor doesn't care who the cha uh, state chairman is because they're all running for governor, and uh, gone are the days of Bob Bennett, Bob Bennett picking and choosing who the nominees are. Herb, is that a good thing? I think I, I like contested primaries. I think, <laughs> of course, you do. <laughs> I mean, it's, well, it's, just, it's a way to. You're in it's, that, yeah. Frankly, it's a way to. I don't, I don't like backroom deals. But I, th I think somebody. you should be elected by the by the it, members it, of the party. It's a sad commentary for the Democratic Party that the most significant factor right now might be how is the Trump administration doing, and if the Trump administration is doing poorly, or more importantly, if the economy goes into the tank then in fact 2018 begins to look like a good democratic year. But that's saying the Democrats are really at the mercy of forces over which they have no control. And meanwhile... That's they what they did this time. They hoped mm -hmm. that Trump would lose yeah, yeah. rather than Hillary Clinton and, would win. And, right? and, yeah. right. and meantime, you know, they still have to put... To, you know, you don't beat somebody with nobody. So you still have to put together a ticket. And you particularly have to have strength at the top of the ticket. And if you think about the U.S. Senate race, you know, certainly Senator Brown running against, I assume, Treasurer Mandel, uh, Sherrod Brown would certainly want to see a Democratic ticket that is more than just his leading the ticket, but a, a candidate for governor who can get more than 35 percent of the vote. <laughs> and, <a> and, <laughs> and, you know, so I think, but I think actually the midterm, you know, we don't know. And for all we know, the Trump presidency could be transformational. 
or it could be disastrous. And if the economy doesn't cooperate, or if, far, if the world doesn't cooperate, you know, you, we might have a lot of people with buyer's remorse. I personally feel that um, it'll be interesting to watch the role of the parties uh, in this coming cycle, uh, in this midterm election, because they are in flux, and Donald Trump really rewrote the book in terms of not doing anything traditional. You know, he. He uh, skipped debates. He didn't do fundraising. He didn't tweeted his on his returns, own. Yeah. He didn't release his tax returns. And not every candidate can be sort of Teflon like that. Uh, some come along who can. And uh, it'll be interesting to watch whether uh, the parties play a huge role. When do we see, Laura, a Democratic candidate emerge, do you think, the next six months or so? For yeah, Governor? I would say the next six months they're gonna, somebody's going to have to get pretty serious. Um, I keep hearing the same names that Julie kind of tossed out. And, Betty Sutton, Tim, um, Ryan. Tim Ryan. Tim Ryan. It seems like he's always mentioned that he never, never leaves the the uh, comfort of running in a safe district. Um, yeah, I mean, there's yeah. others. I think G Joe Schiavone, the Senate Minority Leader, would want to run, although he'd, mm -hmm. he'd have a lot of name ID to, to build up. Well, but Pillage. think of the millions they're going to have to. Re all those names that were mentioned, millions over a Mike DeWine, over a John Houston, Mary Taylor, just to get the name ID out there. All those names we know them because this is what we do for a living. The average person on the street, I have better name ID than all those people you just named, <laughs> and that's not Mike, my. Mike, you have great. <laughs> Mike's because got of you. <laughs> <laughs> Are you changing parties? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, it's a familiar notion at the state house that state lawmakers are supposed to be mindful, even defer, to the power of home rule. That is the power of cities and villages to make their own rules. However, a new law makes it even more difficult for Ohio municipalities to set and enforce their own laws. That is if they conflict with state law. Gun rights, fracking, minimum wage, and more recently traffic cameras have all come into play in this debate over state versus local authority. Mike Onodakis, Republicans hate big government. They hate the federal government messing with states. Why is a Republican-led legislature and a governor taking away rights of cities and towns? Why is big Ohio government tromping on or tramping on, uh, trampling on local governments? I'm not sure it's apples to apples to compare the federal government versus state government because in D.C. so many bad things happen and it's a waste of money. Yeah, everything, and time. In, everything in Columbus is peaches so and cream. Better. But, it, but it, the fact is we're right here in Columbus. We're two hours from every city that we affect in government. I'm a big fan of reining in home rule, um, whether it be uh, because of uh, businesses not choosing not to come here. If you're a business with multi-sites and you want to open in six cities but you have to follow six different city ordinances, you're not going to do it because you want one level playing field. They tried to do it to Uber to regulate Uber out, Mayor Coleman and others, uh, a company that I'm very close to, Petland, they tried to just put them out of business after 50 years. Um, oil and gas industry, we have to be careful. There's a role for home rule and there's a there's a job for local municipalities, but when we're trying to create jobs and we're trying to stop the brain drain, look at our taxes in Franklin County alone with all these school levies passing and now Clarence Mango coming out saying our properties are now going to go up even more. It's too expensive to live here, so when big small government is too expensive. Big government needs to step in. I'm guessing folks in the rural communities think differently. <laughs> Well, yeah. yes, I was just going to say that, you know, this uh, argument that Mike makes doesn't really raise the issue that the Democrats control most of city politics in the state, and we have Democratic mayors that are setting agendas different than what the Republican majority at the state house likes on things like guns, minimum wage, mm -hmm. fracking, mm -hmm. um, and in some cases, uh, uh, courts have had to weigh in on whether or not what they're trying to do is legal. Yeah, this is a very ideological and partisan thing, and it's happening throughout the country. And, and basically what's happening is in many states where you have Republican legislatures, but you have cities and counties that are dominated by Democrats, in fact, uh, the Republican legislatures and governors sometimes say, well, home rule is fine, except when we don't agree with what the, the localities are doing. <laughs> in Ohio, it just seems to be home rule is, is, is kind of sacred in, in some communities. It's been in the, you know, um, Dayton cherishes, cherishes it, for sure. It's a charter city. Um, and uh, home rule's been in the Constitution since 1912. Um, and the idea was to empower the locals so that they could, um, you know, do self-governance and avoid um, top-down corruption and, uh, and too much of a heavy hand. Even though Columbus does everything wonderfully, right, Mike? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to our final off-the-record parting shots, and we will start with you, Mike Anadakis. Thank you, Mike. Um, it's been over four months since Mayor Ginther announced the committee to come up with a better solution for our, our ward systems or create a ward system. We've heard nothing. It's been over six months since the mayor announced a $50 million smart grant, uh, and he said he was going to promise some of the money to go to the east side. I called east side leaders. They haven't seen anything yet today. 
Uh, I'm not going to continue to go through all the uh, problems I see in the city of Columbus, but at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, where is the Franklin County Republican Party leadership? Why aren't they standing up and trying to hold these people account accountable? This is their job, and they're not doing it. Herb. Uh, much more briefly, the president's inaugural address will be memorable. <laughs> <laughs> memorable. Um, Julie. Um, I just want to say I'm going to be interested to watch John Kasich this week. He's giving a speech Monday um, at the invitation of Martin Luther King's daughter down in Atlanta. Uh, then he heads to Washington to talk about health care uh, with some senators. And he's going to be at the inauguration as well. So he's, he's back in action after a respite. All right. And Laura? Oh, I thought I'd mention a little story uh, that I did this week that didn't get a lot of attention, but I think it's pretty important. Ohio is promoting a new um, a suicide prevention um, service. It's a crisis text line. Um, people who are having trouble can text the numeral 4 HOPE uh, to 741 741 and get connected right away to a, a counselor. Great That's advice. Great and great resource. My prediction along the lines of Herb's, it, it will be a memorable inaugural address. We'll have it here on WOSU TV, also 897 NPR News. I do predict, even though it may not be the most widely attended inaugural, it will be the most watched on television. And even if it's not, Donald Trump will say it was. <laughs> <laughs> that is Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and our website, WOSU.org. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.